everybody. Welcome to ICC's Game of the Week with your host as always, Joel Benjamin. Two grandmasters registered impressive performances in the Edmonton International. Surya Ganguly of India ripped off seven wins to start the tournament, but came up empty against American GM Sam Shankland. Shankland, who had surrendered but one draw, took the lead going into the last round. Now, Ganguly was able to catch up when Shankland drew his final encounter. He needed an especially clutch win over a very strong veteran grandmaster, Alexei Shirov. I'm going with that one for this week's feature. A super sharp Svezhenkov with possible theoretical repercussions, provided the battlefield for a tense, though relatively brief, struggle. All right, let's get to it. Ganguly, trying to get a share of first place, plays furiously against Shirov, who you know is always ready for fire on board. And so he goes for the so-called Sveshnikov variation, E5, uh, sometimes uh, the position is reached via e6 and then knight db5, and they actually get to the same position with one extra move in. So sometimes if you're looking at positions on, your, on the database, you may see a difference in the number of moves, but exactly the same position. Okay, so bishop g5, a6, and the, the move that is really identified with Sveshnikov is b5. That was an improvement on the older way of playing, and that keeps the knight on a3 from getting right into the center. Now, for many years, you would often see bishop takes f6, pawn takes, knight d5. This is quite a bit sharper than, uh, than knight d5 right away. Uh, but, you know, for whatever reason, the grandmasters don't feel like this is a great chance for an advantage anymore. It certainly was popular. There are many, many different lines that, that come forward from it. And, you know, for the ordinary players, this is still um, could be a popular way. Probably, they, you know, most people tend to follow the fashion of the grandmasters. But there are a lot of sharp lines and sacrifices that appeal to a lot of different players. But uh, generally speaking, uh, it's now felt that uh, the more positional approach, knight d5 and bishop f6, next move, give a better chance for advantage. White, of course, owns the d5 square, but uh, black can maybe later challenge it or even just play around it. All right, so Ganguly plays c3. Now, this used to be routine, but over the last several years... A lot of players have started playing c4, and it's arguably become the main line. There, there have been so many games in recent years, so c3 is almost kind of a throwback. But, but still, it appears in many, many games, and occasionally some important grandmaster games as well. Okay, so this position has occurred thousands of times, and it's impossible, of course, to recap all of the theory. But basically, from here... Black has three, move, three moves that he's interested in playing over the next two turns, okay? You know, white is going to bring the knight back to c2, and then he's going to push the pawn to a4, right? Or he has the idea to push the pawn to a4 and break up those pawns. So from here, black can play, uh, has, has these ideas. Bishop g5, he wants, also wants a castle. And he has the idea of playing rook b8 to inhibit uh, a4. Okay, so in this game, uh, Sheriff plays bishop g5. So first let's consider if he omits that move, right? Let's say castles, knight c2, and rook b8. Back in the day when I played the Sveshnikov, which probably wasn't really my style in hindsight, but I played it a bunch of times, I had a game against Kamsky, um, from uh, from from this position, and uh, he played actually the most common move h4, and we see that uh, idea from time to time because if black does not get that bishop to g5, getting it active, then h4 can prevent it from getting to that square. I think I played knight e7, allowing my kingside to be broken.